And remind me, how long is the conversation? Well, I mean, uh, we're, we're, we're happy to accommodate you. We, we usually go for an hour or give or take. But if you're if you're in a rush, I mean, you know, however, uh, however what, what's it look like on your end? I think that's I think that's OK. I think it's possible that someone in my family might come and signal me at some point And um, uh, I might uh, I don't know if I if I if I find any Can I just say that on the air? Should I totally should I totally don't you? worry oh, about yeah, it? Sure. Okay. No, honestly, okay. we're rolling right okay. now. So like all of this <laughs> okay. about your family signaling is part of the entire experience. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Sounds uh, sounds good. So where are you, Peter? Uh, so we're staying with friends on Long Island. We basically have friends who have a house and outside the city and they invited us to come with them and we um went and you've been there since 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 this uh this craziness started yes the uh, the big basically the big appeal for us is not being in the city the big appeal for them is that their kids have our kids to hang oh, out of with. course of course um, of course and they're, they're friends they're friends so um you know they go, to, they go to the same school and everything so um so yeah it's uh it's been it's been nice uh I, it's been you know it's, it's made things a little bit easier. So it's like a, a family pod. Shadi and I have been have been actually, yes. you know, even even within within quarantine. Uh, well, we we did a few episodes remote, but uh, mostly we've braved it. I had to wash off his microphone when he left just to make sure that's not. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah. Go so ahead, Shadi. I guess yeah. I mean, um, uh, well, so it's interesting that um, Peter, your your two big articles came out. Um, obviously last week at a time when people were consumed by a lot of different things. And there's something refreshing about not having to talk about cancel culture. That said, it, I, I will just note that um, there's something really re refreshing also about the fact that y you're able to write these two articles calling for a one state solution. And it's controversial, of course, but at the same time, it's not that controversial that the range of discourse on this issue has widened quite considerably. And, you know, this is now part of the mainstream discussion where maybe five or 10 years ago, um, if someone had written something like this, it would have been dismissed or ignored as crazy, irrational, um, silly, um, or even worse, or, or um, you know, anti-Semitic even perhaps in some quarters. So I think it says something that at least on this issue in particular, I think our conversation in this country is much more is much more diverse and, and vigorous. And we're hearing about new possibilities that weren't discussed seriously before. Um, so that's good. But, but, you know, but mention, yeah. mention, of course, it's Peter Beinart that we're talking I, to because you haven't yet intro him as you <laughs> dive yeah, into yeah. this, though so, most people will know. Yeah. So, this, <laughs> so this is my lead in. Well, I should. So we're very happy to have you. Uh, so Peter, Peter Beinart is our special guest tonight. Um, many of you will be familiar with him and his work. He's an he's editor at large at Jewish Currents. He's a contributor at The Atlantic. He's a professor at the Newmark School of Journalism at, at CUNY, and also the author of several books, including most recently, The Crisis of Zionism, and before that, The Icarus Syndrome. And uh, so, Peter, welcome. Great to have you. Um, and uh, Well, go on then. Now, you, you, <laughs> yeah. you did your big lead in there. Well, anyway, Peter, I, here, let me, let, me, let me rephrase what, what Shadi said there, because I, you know, and I... Yeah, because I actually have some thoughts about Shadi's intro as well, actually. Oh, well, then, well, look... I, let, some of which I, I agree with and some of which I don't totally agree with. My question is, in, in, the, in the spirit of Shadi's intro, is how much is the current moment, um, both, you know, what's going on, never mind the COVID and, and, and the sort of uh, situations where we find ourselves with more time to, to think and, and, and delve into things, but also the current broader social moment. How much did that influence uh, what Shadi was sort of saying? So I don't know, take either of those, run with it, however you like. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot. Um, so I think that um, it is true, I, I think as Shadi was saying, that I think that the, the parameters of conversation on Israel-Palestine um, are wider than they were. But I think that the, the the kind of cancel culture that people worry about in other contexts remains um, a pretty significant force in this conversation. Um, in 2003, Tony Judd wrote an essay in the New York Review of Books uh, calling for for equality in one in one state. Not exactly the same argument as mine, but with some similarities. And he faced enormous blowback and had speeches canceled and other things like that. Um, 
I, uh, I think that the intervening 17 years and the fact that um, most observers would say that the two-state solution has become m m less and less likely um, has opened some po greater openness to this conversation. And certainly it, is, it is, has become the dominant conversation among Palestinians. But I will just note, not, not to make my life sound so terrible, it's not. I'm, I'm very, very fortunate in the sense that I interact in this conversation with a lot of advantages and privileges that make it much easier for me to engage. Um, but, you know, the, the Anti-Defamation League did send a letter to the editor of the New York Times saying my essay was anti-Semitic, you know. Oh, wow. Didn't see that. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, it, it's a just, I ha you know, and, 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 you know, there are people who've been saying that we shouldn't be allowed to go to our synagogue and my kids shouldn't be allowed to go to their Jewish school. And, you know, I mean, I have to say, like, it, there is something just slightly otherworldly or a kind of out-of-body experience when you, like, you know, you wake up in the morning, you put on fill and you pray, you study a page of Talmud, and then you turn and then you go on your computer and you found you've been called anti-Semitic by the premier uh, American Jewish anti-discrimination organization. Right. So, I mean, like this still the, and, 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 you know, and, and, you know, I can whatever to some degree I can kind of laugh it off. Right. Um, but, um, you know, but for for people who don't have it's it's harder I don't, when you, to laugh it off if you're not Jewish. You know, um, um, and 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 Palestinians really struggle to get access to the mainstream conversation when they have views like this, and and so I I really think that I mean I I I, I think that the that one of the frustrations I have about the conversation about cancel culture um, is that I often feel like people in my own community, in the American Jewish community don't take responsibility for the fact that our organized institutions are often the worst offenders. Um, uh, and so I do think that, um, I, I do think that it remains a really, really significant problem. Um, anyway, just, that's not, that's a kind of meta conversation. It doesn't have anything to do with the substance of, of what I wrote. Um, but I, I do think it's a, I think if we want to create a broad front against cancel culture, um, that, it, that, that a shift within inside the organized American Jewish community in the way that it responds to what it claims is anti-Semitism, which very often is not anti-Semitism, but actually just kind of the natural expression of Palestinian political experience, is, is, has to be part of that. Yeah, well, maybe maybe now to just dive into the substance. Um, so yeah. we'll, we'll include links to the two articles the longer essay in Jewish Currents, and then the op-ed in your Times in the show notes, and we encourage everyone to give those a read. I would actually say especially the Jewish Currents essay because it goes into a lot of detail. And I'll, I'll say just from my standpoint, and we'll dive into this a little bit more later, as someone who's been quite skeptical of the one-state solution and has generally dismissed it to one degree or another, I think, Peter, your essay is, is the the best version of the argument that I've seen. And while I was reading it, I almost found myself being won over in real time. Maybe not completely, but I'm like, huh, I can, this is, this is something that I can work with. Uh, it's not something that anyone should dismiss out of hand. So uh, kudos to you for, for, for writing that and laying it out I in a lot of that. detail. Yeah, but maybe just for those who will not have necessarily read the articles yet, and maybe what would be not not to push you and ask you for an elevator pitch, sure. but if you had to sure. give the elevator sure. pitch for for <laughs> not, a, not to put you on the spot, but, but for a one state option in Israel Palestine, and imagine quite literally if you were with um, um, a friend or a colleague of yours in the elevator and you just wanted to sell them very quickly, how would you do that? I don't get into elevators with anyone anymore, right? <laughs> yes, the, good point. COVID, we can't use that metaphor anymore. It's too <laughs> yeah. dangerous. My argument is that while you can't say mathematically that the two-state solution is impossible because you can never, you know, m rule out with certainty any historical eventuality, that the chances of the creation of a viable and sovereign Palestinian state, and I think those words are important because what's happened is that as Israeli settlement has become more and more entrenched, people have kind of kept idea uh, alive the idea of a Palestinian state by basically divesting of it, both its territorial contiguity and its sovereignty, making it something much less than a state. If you believe that an actual Palestinian state is now extremely unlikely, and you believe, as I do, that it's morally unacceptable to hold millions of Palestinians as stateless non-citizens under Israeli control, you have to at least be willing to think about, uh, about alternatives that would allow Palestinians 
to have the rights to be citizens of the country in which they live. And the country in which they live is Israel. Israel controls all the land between the Mediterranean and the Jordan. And people often say that binational states don't work very well. And their binational states are very challenging animals. But the argument that I make is that Israel is already a binational state. It controls all the land between the Mediterranean and the Jordan, and it, it controls two separate nations, two separate peoples of roughly equal size. And so when people say that they don't want Israel to be a binational state, what they're really saying is they don't want Israel to be a binational state that gives Palestinians the right to vote and a voice in government. And I argue that actually political science research would tell us that binational states work better when everyone has a voice in government than when one side is largely excluded. Um, many people would see this as the end of Zionism, but I argue, as someone who considers myself a Zionist, that Zionism doesn't necessarily mean Jewish statehood, that it can mean a Jewish home, a Jewish society that provides refuge and rejuvenation to the Jewish world, and that that's actually how it was conceived by early 20th century Zionist thinkers from Theodor Herzl to Zev Jabotinsky to Leon Pinsker uh, to Achad Ka'am. And so that Jews, that this place which is precious to us, this society, can remain uh, and still be vibrant and still be a Jewish home, even in a context of equality for Palestinians. So, so Peter, like it sounds then part part of the pitch is contingent or let's say circumstantial and that circumstances have gotten so bad in recent years under Netanyahu that we've reached this, to use the cliche, a point of return. So is, is it correct to say that this is not, this wouldn't have been your ideal, but the situation on the ground has in some sense forced you to take what might be a suboptimal position? It's a little bit more complicated than that. The way I would put it is the two state solution is also uh, suboptimal and probably should not be seen as a solution at all, but at best, the beginnings of a solution. Um, uh, I would have still been willing to take it as the beginnings of a solution. But when one thinks about, um, I don't think, again, it's even now possible as the beginnings of a solution. But it is important when thinking about the menu of options to remember the limitations of the two-state solution in two prim primary ways. First of all, 20% of Israel's own citizens, this is not the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, but Israel proper, are Palestinian. That Palestinian population will never be satisfied living in a Jewish state because Jewish statehood by its very nature makes Palestinians second class citizens. So even if you did create a Palestinian, you know, people tend to think of Palestinians as kind of all living in the West Bank, Gaza and East Jerusalem. Only about a third to 40 percent of Palestinians live in those territories. 20% of Israel's population are Palestinians who will still struggle against living in a Jewish state, even if there were a Palestinian state next door, because they can't tell their kids that they can grow up to be prime minister of this country. And who would be happy with that? Secondly, the, the Pal this two-state solution, as generally conceived of by most Israeli and American diaspora Jews, allows for almost no refugee return. Um, and I think that there are serious, this is, this is not an easy conversation in the American Jewish community, but I think there are very serious questions to ask w about by what historical right we deny Palestinian refugees the right to return to their homes. And I also think that if there were to be a Palestinian state that did not allow significant refugee return, it could potentially be, a, it could be a, merely a ceasefire. Um, because the Palestinian desire for refugee return is so, is so great that a, that a solution that did not provide an answer for that, for people to be able to actually return to the places where they were born or their parents were born, might ultimately not ultimately solve some of the deepest problems we face here. And, okay, and, you know, since we have, you know, I don't, I don't think you've discussed this um, elsewhere for the most part, but mm. can you maybe tell us a little bit about how you, what was the germination process for this? I mean, how did, how, how did you d decide to, let's say, come out as a supporter of a binational or, or one state? And Peter, before you answer that, I mean, let me even maybe sharpen that question, because I, I, I think one of the things that, that, that comes out to me from reading it is that, that's why I was asking earlier about the current moment. And, you know, you, you were talking about the, the cancel culture and that, that's really interesting, but also the sort of the, the social justice moment. Has that sharpened your, your feeling? You talk about that, you know, this is a moment that a certain kind of consensus, a moral consensus is likely to be built. And you, you, you cite Black Lives Matter as an example that could, could be motivating this. How much is it 
Yeah, I mean, talks a little bit what Shadi's saying about your 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 getting to this point, but also about this current moment. If you can maybe address that. Sure. So, I mean, the major impetus for me writing this was really just the sense that I had been making a set of arguments for the two-state solution that I was finding less convincing. I mean, I don't know if you guys have had this experience, but you know, you go, you write for a living, or you go and sometimes speak for a living, and you, you, I can hear my when I when I'm making arguments that are no longer entirely convincing me. Like I know it, you know, mm. and um, and as a writer, you know, you can be wrong, and goodness knows I've been wrong a lot, but. It's one thing to be wrong. It's another thing to consciously make arguments that you no longer find convincing. I think that's kind of death as a writer. Um, and so I, um, I, I just felt like this, these arguments were not really compelling to me anymore. And I needed to start looking and thinking for alter- about alternatives. And so I just spent, went and spent a lot of time reading and talking to different people. I spent a lot of time reading about other divided societies and their historical evolutions. I spent a lot of time writing about reading into the literature about about one state in Israel, Palestine. I spent a lot of time reading about kind of Zionist and Palestinian history from the first half of the 20th century and different alternatives that were discussed. And I, I kind of gradually began to see my way, the outlines of a, of a kind of an argument that might, I found be more compelling to me. Um, it, you know, it wasn't, so it wasn't provoked by the Black Lives Matter in particular. In fact, I think I, I started working on it before these, you know, the George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd. But, um, I will say that the Black Lives Matter movement was a reminder to me, an inspirational reminder that this conversation about what is realistic and what is possible, which is, you know, immediately thrown at you when you talk about equality in Israel-Palestine, that what is considered feasible and realistic in one historical moment is not the same as in another historical moment. And we have seen over in various points in, 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 in history in, uh, that mass movements with a powerful moral vision can change the limit of what is considered politically possible. And so that was a kind of inspiration for me in thinking about the creation of a mass movement with a moral vision that could change the terrain, the t- parameters of what we consider possible in Israel-Palestine. I, you know, I, 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 I have to say that that to me is, is uh, the really the core uh, uh, element of the essay that I, like Shadi, I think, you know, that, I'm not. I'm not an expert, uh, even close, um, uh, on these matters. But you know, uh, you work at a magazine, you read a bunch of essays, and sort of you, you get familiar with uh, uh, with arguments. And I, I, I too felt that you know that that part of your argument uh, was was really strong. But you know, what struck me when you you were talking just earlier about the two state solution and sort of how that's also less than ideal. But at one point, you're talking about sort of, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of what this ends up looking like. And you even at some point say maybe, you know, con- confederalism is a, a kind of model for this, that you have sort of, you know, these almost communities living side by side with with uh, almost uh, delegating certain a s- certain subset uh, of their of their responsibilities to something, some some Israel, Palestine state, unified state that is the equivalent of the of the European Union. It's interesting yeah. once you get down into it, the the differences between two state and one state, yeah. they, they get muddy. And what you're talking about is, yeah. is basically it's, it's a moral approach to getting there and the moral suasion that sort of is the, the best way to get to where, you, you know, you think is the right way to get to, right? Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. I certainly, yes. No, uh, yeah. I, 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 I could never, I could not have, I didn't try to lay out all of the, the an entire blueprint. And, you know, this, we know, you know, if you, again, if you look at what happened in South Africa between, let's say, the release of Nelson Mandela which I think was in 1990 and the first free election in 1994, or you look at the the Good Friday Agreement, which I think was the product of three years of intensive negotiations. Um, What you see is that there's a political process that emerges once you create preconditions for for kind of an equal, uh, for for, for the pre, once you have the baseline of the idea of equality, and then there's a political struggle in which things can take different forms. I have no idea all the details of this, but I do think that one of the really crucial elements that would be necessary and is and, and, and is possible within confederation or within one state is the possibility of for free movement, and the, which could mean that Palestinian refugees could return, uh, and also that Jewish settlers in the West Bank could remain in the West Bank. Um, now, there would have to be a process of, of compensation for land that they or the Israeli state had essentially stolen on their behalf. They couldn't continue to live in ethnically exclusive communities like they do now. 
But I think that that actually might be a really powerful part of the answer because of the depth of the importance of for Palestinians of ref- refugees returning, but also because of the depth of importance for many Jews, especially religious Jews of the West Bank. You know, one of the things that I think sometimes is not always understood in this conversation is that from a biblical perspective, you know, if you look at the book of Genesis, um, much more of the book of Genesis takes place in the West Bank than it takes place in Israel proper. For, 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 for religious Jews, cities like Hebron and Nablus, which is called in the Bible Shechem um, or Bethlehem, are more important than Tel Aviv. And so this potentially provides a certain kind of opportunity for the realization of or Jews who want to live anywhere in the land as well as Palestinians, as opposed to a, a vision of separation, which doesn't. Okay, so... That makes that makes sense. I mean, I, I guess so. One thing that you said earlier that really resonates with me is this idea that. So I'm still someone who's skeptical of a of a binational state, but where I definitely agree with you is that the two state solution. I can't even muster a proper defense of it. <laughs> I mean, so and I and I came into this thinking that I'd I'd want to push you a little bit in a friendly way, of course, but I'm finding it your vision as laid out in the essay is honestly more compelling than any effort I could, I could kind of bring up where I'm like, Oh, two States, whatever. It just, it feels like we're so past that point. And if you had talked to me maybe a year ago, I would have offered up a stronger defense, but at some point things keep on happening. Events keep on happening. And I can't in any good conscience go to a Palestinian now and say, hey, you guys should fight for a two-state solution and remain um, strong and stubborn on that despite everything that has happened in recent years, but also recent decades. I just, I can't do that. So if I was a Palestinian living in the West Bank and Gaza, I think that the more moral solution, the more moral option, but also the option that is just more inspiring for any burgeoning mass movement is to call for universal principles, and you've pointed to some of those, equality, justice, so on and so forth. So, but I, but I do want to, I guess if I really, now that I'm like trying to push back a little bit, I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think there's one strong argument and you'll, you'll probably um, be able to predict it because I think it's from what I've seen online, it's the one mm-hmm. that keeps on coming up, which really mm-hmm. has to do with the fact that how do you, which is, in some sense, a practicality argument that how do you get the vast majority of Israeli Jews to agree to this vision and Israel being a flawed, a flawed but still functioning democracy to one degree or another. um, At some level, there has to be, the state has to be responsive and accountable to its own people. And if we're talking about the 80% or so of, of Israel that is Jewish, it's hard to imagine a majority of of them getting on board with this idea. So what it would require if we're kind of gaming this out is Jews themselves somehow undoing their own commitment and belief in their own state. And from that's not very common in, in human history. It's very hard to get people to agree to that. And South Africa is different you know, in, in many ways, but one way is that um, white South Africans were a relatively small minority. Um, Jews in this case are the majority in their own in their own state. Um, so it's it's a big ask, right? I mean, to ask Jews to give something up. I I, I mean, just walk me through that a little bit. Right. So I think you're, you're right, certainly. This, this view among uh, Israeli Jews is a, is a pretty marginal uh, view right now. Um, um, but I think, you know, we have to remember that um, in any context, in, in, in almost any historical context, when you have a, a population that has basic rights and sits alongside another group of people that they're denying basic rights, um, that they're not likely um, uh, they're not likely to, to be very open to a change absent some forces that force them to recognize that the status quo is not sustainable. I mean, it wasn't as if white Americans um, kind of you know, woke up one day uh, in the 1960s and said, you know what, maybe African-Americans in the South deserve the right to vote. 
right? That, that the white America, that only happened um, because there was a movement that forced um, in various different ways the white population that, that made a compelling moral argument, but also just made it clear that the status quo was impossible. I mean, the Kennedy and Johnson administrations realized that unless they met Martin Luther King's demands, there was going to be chaos. Um, and, and if you look at what happened in South Africa, again, it wasn't as if white South Africans kind of woke up one day and said, we think apartheid's a bad idea. We did, you know, it was a mistake to begin with. What they saw was that basically starting in the 1980s, an uprising emerged inside South Africa, which was twinned with uh, international pressure. And they realized that the status quo, that, that they just could not go on the same way anymore. Um, and so, uh, you know, similarly with Protestants in Northern Ireland after decades of IRA uh, uh, struggle. And so I think that the part of the reason that this is so hard to imagine now is that the cost of occupation um, for the last 15 years for Israeli Jews has been really quite low. Um, since the end of the Second Intifada in 2005, the Palestinian Authority has done something that is quite extraordinary in some ways. I mean, it's funny because, again, in the Jewish community, we often just think of Palestinians as so radical and violent and dangerous. For 15 years in the West Bank, the Palestinian Authority has, has functioned as Israel's subcontractor, protecting Israeli Jews against the prospect of Palestinian violence, and basically keeping things quiet and allowing Israel to function with, you know, to control all these people at fairly low cost. Plus, Israel, because it's such an economic powerhouse and because it's also benefited from this turn towards right wing authoritarianism around the world, which has given it all of these new friends from Modi to Bolsonaro to Orban to Trump has faced very little international pressure. So in those circumstances, there's no reason to think that Israeli Jews would contemplate any alternative. And indeed, they haven't been willing to support. They've, they've basically moved to stick the, to, 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 you know, to, to hammer the last nails in the two state solution as well. So my larger point is that it is only when the balance of power shifts that Israeli Jews will start to think about any other alternatives. Um, and I, for me, the thing that I worry about a lot is I believe that in some, sooner or later it is going to shift. The cost of controlling millions of people who lack basic rights will go up because those people will not be quiescent forever. What I really hope is that there can be a nonviolent and peaceful and even kind of loving pressure that Palestinians, in conjunction with some of us Jews, put on the Israeli government to force people to recognize that the status quo is not possible. And that creates a new political conversation uh, in Israel. I don't think it'll happen quickly. Um, I worry that, that instead the result may be that what we have is a lot of, is a lot of violence. Um, but sooner or later, I think Israeli Jews are going to realize that the status quo that they're comfortable with now is not actually sustainable. But, but isn't there the possibility that um, Israeli Jews will respond to growing pressure of the sort you've just described by hardening their attitudes. I mean, there is some, there does appear to be some precedent for that, that when, when there is a perception of um, international discomfort with Israeli, the Israeli occupation, Israeli Jews ha have not necessarily gone in, in a more dovish direction if we look at various uh, surveys and, and polling. And I mean, if, if, if the pressure was loving, then maybe, but we know, unfortunately, that loving pressure is going to be mixed in with people who, in some sense, let's just say it, hate Israel and perhaps mm -hmm. hate Jews, mm -hmm. and maybe are careful about how they um, how they describe their position. Mm -hmm. But not everyone has um, Israeli Jews' best interest in mind. For them, they may see this more as an opportunity um, to claim, in the long run, a decisive victory over Israeli Jews. Mm -hmm. And they don't see it as, in the spirit of coexistence as you do. So, um, I mean, keeping that reality in mind that you're going to have a lot of problematic voices mixed in with what might otherwise be a moral and just international call, then Israeli Jews may not respond in the way we might wish them to. Also, Peter, you yeah, know, before, before you even do that, you know, yeah. I mean, just to even sharpen that point a little bit, um, you 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 alluded to uh, you know uh, Netanyahu making friends with India with Modi with uh, with Putin right. uh, with with China right. we we see that also right. you know uh, mm. and the other part I think you know I think this was Netanyahu's big call it unfortunate innovation right is that mm. he started playing American domestic 
uh, politics. Now, right. so, you know, it's a moral cause. And I, again, I think to reiterate again, I think you, you do a wonderful job laying it out. But but when we're talking about like what actually shifts in the right. global context, you're talking about right. uh, perhaps uh, American Jews who vote Democrat uh, becoming mm-hmm. very much energized by this. But, you know, evangelicals mm-hmm. and 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 basically the Republican Party uh, becoming, in fact, perhaps radicalized in the other direction. So you have a split mm-hmm. domestically and you have perhaps another split emerging during at least democratic tenures in in american in america that israel hues closer to india that's already happening russia already happening uh you know china and and so you have basically a shift a domestic shift in attitudes in america mm. uh europe already for all the reasons shadi laid out you know with very mixed uh motives i think the way they they approach the the the, the entire question um how much of a shift is all of this ultimately, you know, in, in the best case scenario? Yeah. So I guess let me try to answer t- the two different parts of that. The first is I actually I think it's certainly true that Israeli Jews, like many peoples around the world, would like to tell you that the tough, you know, the, the more pressure you put on them, the, the, the stiffer their spines become. But I actually don't think that's the history bears that out. Um, I, you know, and I, I think one book that really lays out this argument very effectively is Nathan Thrall's book, um, uh, The Only Language They Understand. Nathan argues, you know, basically going back to really the Eisenhower administration, that, that the only time Israel's ever made any territorial compromises have been under intense pressure, either from the United States or from Palestinian behavior. Um, you know, we forget, but that it was it was pretty routine for American presidents between the 1950s and the early 1990s to threaten uh, Israel with with limit with cutting military aid, not sending weapon systems when Israel did things the United States didn't like. And time and time again, whether it was Israeli, whether it was Israel's behavior in in Lebanon or Israel or other Israeli behavior, the, the Israeli prime minister is basically told it. I mean, Israel is a client state of the United States in, in 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 significant ways. And if you look at the impact of Palestinian pressure, I mean, the only the main reason the Oslo Accords began and that Israel recognized the PLO as a legitimate as a as a legitimate negotiating partner in 1983 was because the uprising which started in the late 1980s from Palestinians showed that the, the status quo was no longer tenable. Even the second intifada between 2000 and 2005, which was argued, which was counterproductive in certain ways because of the kind of suicide bombing and, and the extreme violence that didn't characterize the first intifada as much, even that, Thrall argues, I think pretty convincingly, was a big part of the reason ultimately which led Ariel Sharon to withdraw Israeli settlements from Gaza. Over the last 15 years, Without a serious demand, either from Palestinians or from the international community, I think a big part of the reason that for Benjamin Netanyahu's political success is he's basically shown Israelis that they can have their cake and eat it too. They can maintain the occupation. They can have a booming economy. They can have international acceptance. So why would they change? If you Netanyahu's center-left opponents, like you know, like um, Ehud Barak and 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 Tzipi Livni, were always saying this path is unsustainable, and Netanyahu said it's, it is sustainable. So we have to show that it's not sustainable. Now the other part of your argument, which is you know, is is that the international environment is such that there will not be that kind of international pressure. And I, I, you're right that Israel has a lot to offer a lot of countries and has formed very strong relationships in terms of you know military technology, economic. Uh, interactions and, and also ideological affinities. But I do think it's possible to imagine a scenario in which there is a shift in the United States, in the Democratic Party, um, and also in Europe that, that, that does change the calculus. I mean, it is still the United States, not India or China or Russia, which prevents any sanctions against Israel in, in the international arena. It's the U.S. that does that. It's not them that does that. Um, and um, the Europeans would go further in terms of sanctions against Israel. They basically resist because of the United States largely. And in the Democratic Party, I think we are in the early stages of a pretty significant shift. Certainly not in the Republican Party. That, you, you're right about that. But just look at the polling. You know, you and I, we, there's only one member of Congress that I know of, Rashida Tlaib, is the only one who supports an equal state. And yet, if you look at Americans under the age of 35, this is already the preferred option for them. I think it's totally, it's quite possible that this view, equality, becomes the dominant view among progressive Democrats within the next five years, you know, embraced by people like Bernie Sanders and AOC. And I think it's possible that we could have a situation where there is a Palestinian uprising in the coming years, 
And I pray a nonviolent uprising. And Israel goes to the U.S., as they always do in these matters, and asks for refueling. Says basically, our, we, our ammunition is running low. We need you to send us more weapons. And the American president says to them, we are not going to, there is no military solution here. Um, that's the, that's a, again, I, you know, that is a kind of scenario that I think is possible. Is it likely? I don't know if it's likely, but I think that there are vectors for change that I think one can imagine. But so if that scenario comes about though, um, we might expect that some Israeli leaders then become more open to a middle position, let's say, that they respond to U.S. Mm -hmm. pressure by saying, okay, okay, we got the message. Let's maybe mm -hmm. um, like revisit the two-state option. For them to go mm -hmm. from support for various levels of annexation all the way to being slightly open to a binational state seems like a rather big jump. So, I mean, is this... One way to understand your proposal then mm -hmm. is that it's sort mm -hmm. of a way to bargain, uh, like that you're shifting the Overton window, um, the range of possibilities expands, and you tell Israelis that for the, for some of them, the worst case scenario is on the table, which for some is a binational state mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. isn't full Jewish sovereignty. And then mm -hmm. that's a way to kind of um, reach a compromise solution at some later point so, uh, and, and is, is that an unfair reading or how would you respond to people who say, well, I, oh. I think it's right. I mean, look, that is one, that's one, that's one possibility is that, is that the threat of, of one state makes Israelis Jews more open to two states. And, you know, uh, uh, and, you know, again, if, if uh, um, that's a possibility, but I also think it's, it's a possibility that the terms of debate really shift much more radically than that. Because remember, it's also quite possible that in the coming years, the Palestinian national movement will stop asking for, for two states and will start asking for full equality. Um, be, that, that, that right now, that, that, that Mahmoud Abbas's successors and the PLO will not hew to this position and that we'll, there will move, be an increasing Palestinian demand backed up by people across the pro progressives across the world for equality. Um, it's also, I think, significant to note, note that, the, that, that the inside Israel itself uh, the, the joint list, which is the Palestinian party, is essentially trying to create a Jewish-Palestinian political alliance in support of equality that I think one could imagine starting to get more Jewish support. Another possibility that I, that I suggest in my piece is that Jerusalem, where, uh, which has about 40 percent of its population is Palestinian, but Palestinians don't vote in local elections because they've basically been boycotting them, that that could be a place where you could start to see a Jewish-Palestinian politics emerge, which could essentially show Israeli Jews what this looks like. The last point I'll make, this may sound strange, but there are elements of the Israeli right, including, for instance, the president of Israel, which is kind of a ceremonial position, Reuven Rivlin, that, that are more open to the idea of giving Palestinians the right to vote than they are with separating the land. Right. I mean, it, it is it is strange, but there are voices on the Israeli right that say what is essential to us is that we maintain access to all of this biblically significant land. And we would prefer giving Palestinians equality and the right to vote in this land than we would to partition the land and put us on the other side of a border from places like Hebron, which is, you know, arguably the second most holy city for Jews. So I think that it's also possible that some of those unexpected voices come to the fore over time. Is this likely to happen in the next 10 or 15 years? Probably not. It may be 50 years. And again, of course, I'm not a prophet. I can't predict the, the course of history. But I do think we have to, um, I do think it's possible that things change more radically than we can quite imagine now. So it's really interesting that you mentioned that some on the Israeli right will be open to this because um, Demir and I were actually at a dinner with an Israeli settler at a trip. It's a long story, but um, it's public. Mm -hmm. So I'm not like, I'm not like breaking mm -hmm. any rules here. But so we were on this trip in Israel, and that's actually where some of the ideas around starting a podcast um, came about. Basically, Demir and I were getting in these debates in the bus as we were going to different parts of Israel and the West Bank and debating a lot of these issues around um, religion and nationalism in, in Israel. Then a colleague of ours said, hey, you guys should make this into a podcast. So <laughs> Israel is very relevant to discussion to, in any number of ways. But, you know, a lot it's of a, things get foreign there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
So, but it's interesting that this is really, if I recall the conversation with him uh, over dinner, he said something about one state and giving Palestinians in the, in the, in the territories the right to vote. And he was very confident that this would work um, to his favor to, and, and um, to um, more conservative and ultra-Orthodox um, Jewish communities. And he said basically something along the lines of, yeah, we'll just outvote them. Our birth rate, I oh, mean- Yeah, outbreed and outvote. Out, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was So the- in some ways it was, it was encouraging that he's open to Palestinians voting, but there was also something dark about it that it was this very tribal right. base- like we're gonna, if it comes to that, we're gonna produce more babies, and the and the um, history no, and is bending in the arc of uh, whatever. Well, no, you know, so so Peter, and that gets to to what I'd really also like to talk to you. So I, I'm originally uh, Croatian. I'm an American now for several years. Yeah. I've lived here yeah. most of my life. Um, you know, so obviously the Balkan Wars and and. So one of these things, I, we had Ivan Krastev at, at Shadi's house for, for like a, a, uh. a book party a while ago. And, and he, afterwards, we discussed his book. He, he said something along the lines, he recognized him from the Balkans. He said, you know, in many ways, after the end of the Cold War, everyone said, you know, this is the, the beginning of something else. And then it looked like the Balkans were some sort of aberration that were sort of a stain on the, the, right. the, the progressive right. view. Right. And he said, you know, looking at around the world right now, and you look at the wars in the 1990s in the Balkans, and it's in many ways... Maybe we got that backwards. It's like the template of the Balkans mm-hmm. is in a lot of ways uh, mm-hmm. the the ugly reality of, of sort of humanity going past and mm-hmm. after the mm-hmm. fall of the Soviet Union. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure I, I go full there, but sometimes I do in my darker moments. And, you know, I, I look at I look at like Bosnia, for example. I don't yeah. know when, when you were looking and, and reviewing a lot of these sort of binational yeah. or trinational sort of examples. Yeah. Yeah. Look, it, it's the same language. There's even a Bosnian identity. You know, it, it exists. Mm-hmm. It's historical. It's rooted. Right. Goes back to medieval times. And yet, there's religion. There's there's right. literally religion and right. political entrepreneurs that actually take advantage of this. I feel like a right. lot of what right. what your your essay hangs on is this. You know, mm-hmm. the political science you cite that voting rights and participation diffuses a lot yeah. of this. And maybe, maybe all we're talking about is that like mm. Bosnia was really poorly designed. It's true. Like, you know, Dayton Accords and how that was built was just, yeah. was a not well done. And, and right. there are lessons to be learned there and how you do that. And you wisely steer away from getting too specific, as you said, about blueprints. Mm. But can you yeah. talk a little bit about that? And I mean, what Shadi yeah. was saying as well, these yeah. sorts of, uh, um, uh, I don't know if they're stubborn facts, but sort of, you know, troubling, troubling elements of humanity and, and the ability to sort of bridge these things politically. Yeah. I mean, I think, look, I think that, you know, there's one of the dangers right, for the piece kind of piece that I'm writing is, is, is that there's a kind of, it's a kind of fear of kind of a naive, you know, happily ever after story. That, that's not the way that history works. I mean, even in South Africa, right, which has been the kind of paradigmatic kind of like, you know, good news, success story that makes everyone feel good about the world, right? I mean, post-apartheid South Africa is faced, facing enormous, enormous trouble, you know? Um, uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, it is really, uh, you know, by, you know, really facing, you know, potentially democracy could, could fail there. Um, so um, I think that, um, so I started reading about Bosnia and I will certainly never know as much as, as, as you do about Bosnia, but my sense of where Bosnia is in its kind of tripartite, very complicated political um, arrangement that tries to give a voice to Bosniaks and, um, and, and, and Croats and Serbs is that it's very dysfunctional, that it's virtually a failed state, and yet that there has not been a return to the kind of killing fields of the 1990s. And so I think one also always has to ask the question, kind of compared to what? True. That seems to me a lot better than where things might have been if you hadn't tried to give a voice in government to Bosnia, Bosniaks and Croats as, as well as Serbs. Um, and I, I think that there's no doubt that in Israel-Palestine that tried to be an equal state would face enormous difficulties. It's a country that is, you know, it's a place that's renowned for a kind of religious extremism, but it also has certain advantages. Um, you know, if you think about what correlates with democratic stability, and it would be far, far from from utopia. But I think that we have to think about what the alternative path is. Um, I think the alternative path is 
cycles after cycles of war and 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 uprisings. I mean, you or you have a situation of apartheid in the West Bank, and you have a Gaza that has been said by the UN to be uninhabitable by human beings. And my fear is that you that in that cycle of uprisings, we may move closer and closer to mass population expulsion. This is, after all, in Israel's political DNA. Israel did it in its, at its founding in 1947-1948. Polling shows that between the third and a half of Israeli Jews already would basically like to expel the Palestinian population. And so I think we, we have to face, think about what the real world alternatives here are while recognizing that equality would not be a panacea. You know, and, and Peter, maybe on this point, um, just to dig a little bit deeper on this and also drawing, this was very much in evidence in, in, when we were in Israel last year, we, when we were meeting with even centrist or vaguely center left folks, it was very clear that public opinion had shifted to the right with pretty much everyone we were talking to yeah. um, who wasn't like on the left left. And, and, but there's also a, a, a major difference in the se- the sensibility of many Israelis compared to say American Jews where, because they have a darker view of human nature and there's this idea of living in a, in a tough neighborhood to use the kind of cliche yes. there yeah. that they look at American Jews, American Jews, and this was conveyed right. to us many times. There was sure. almost a resentment, like, who sure. are you Americans coming to us with right. all of your moral idealism? We don't right. have the luxury for moral right. ideals. We just want to survive. And if that right. means betraying core universalist principles, so be it. And they, and sometimes in private, they would be very open with us about, hey, this sucks for Palestinians. We get it. And but you know what? If that's a price, if that's a price we have to pay um, to safeguard our survival um, and we can look the other way, they would say, because, you know, we're doing really well and Palestine is not the number one issue for us as it maybe was before. And we're willing to live with that. And that might sound heartless, but a lot of human history is heartless. And I just, we just lost Peter at the very last bit of you there. You'll notice that he fell off there because you were in the middle of the sentence. Peter. All right. So finish. Yeah, your, so, now finish your thoughts, Shadi. I, I know you cut off. I watched, I watched, I watched <laughs> you fall off as soon as Shadi was, uh, was talking. So finish your thought. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm on my computer now in hopes that that'll work better than my Okay. Phone. Great, great, great. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess you caught Peter like the, wh- where I was going with that. You were talking about Israeli Jews and how they don't feel like they have the luxury of universal values and they're just- Yeah, yeah. And I guess like, I mean, we, we might not don't. include this because I, I think we just will keep my, my full thought in. But basically I was just saying how um, that they might acknowledge that Palestinians are having a really rough go of it and this is, and it's terrible, but they'll, they'll say, hey, you know, a, a history is about being somewhat heartless in 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 the interest of survival and that they're doing well in Israel proper. And, um, you know, Palestine isn't as big of an issue for them as it was before. So they can kind of look the other way, but there's just like a very, there's a very dark sensibility there that we as Americans don't necessarily share, but other parts of the world do share. Um, so they they might like read your article, Peter, or, hear us talking about Americans, talking about justice, equality, and this moral idealism. And they'll say, we, we, we understand what you're saying. We just want no part in that because it requires us to take a risk. So if there is, um, if there is a, a binational state or even a confederalist um, arrangement, there is a risk that Israeli Jews will have to take and and it, it it's probably a risk they should take from a moral standpoint, but to then tell them that it just they're gonna they might perceive that as us sort of like you're just coming at this from a different set of of starting premises. Right. So I guess I would say first of all, I think that Israeli Jewish discourse uh, would have a lot in common, frankly, with the discourse you would have found amongst most populations that were basically holding other populations in kind of state of bondage, right? Whether if you've been, you know, been talking to white Southerners in the first half of the 20th century or 
Protestants in Northern Ireland or or, or white you know, a, 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 a white South Africans, a lot of places, I think that's generally the discourse, which is that like, we things are pretty good for us. And we think these people are really dangerous if we give them half a chance to actually have some power, right? I mean, that's a normal discourse for people who basically are in a situation where they have power and they're denying other people's rights. Um, they come up with kind of a language of realism um, that to me, frankly, is um, less accurately described as realism and more I frankly described as racism and dehumanization. Uh, and I don't think it's actually realistic because first of all, it assumes that people will indefinitely accept servitude um, and, and denial of, of freedoms, which, it, it, which I think generally they won't and they will find ways of making your life uh, problematic. But secondly, it ignores the basic human reality that people tend to, and that I think political science research confirms, which is that, that that freedom and equality makes violence go down but overall, in general, not go up, right? Because most people, you know, don't, don't get up in the morning wanting to kill or be killed. If they can, ha if they can get their basic needs met um, uh, peacefully, they will. It's only, it's, it's when those things are denied that they become more open to violence because they're facing the violence of oppression. Um, you know, as the Black Lives Matter slogan says, no, no justice, no peace, right? That these things are, are connected. Um, the last point I will make is that, you know, Israeli Jews are very comfortable um, telling Americans, including American Jews, to buzz off, that they're a sovereign country, that they can make their own decisions. But I would note that um, if you want to be moral, if you want to be consistent about it, you want to tell Americans to buzz off with their opinions. You should also tell Americans that you should also say you don't want America's three billion dollars in military aid, and you don't want America's diplomatic protection around the world. It seems to me there is a, a certain incoherence in basically saying we want your money, we want you to protect us diplomatically, no matter what we do, but we don't want you to be able to express opinions about what it is that we do. Um, and and that actually, I think, is the kind of sovereignty that most Israeli Jews are actually talking about. So, you know, as we close up here, Demir, do you have like a final drawing on this? Because, you know, I know you have a lot of thoughts about the the darker. So, yeah. Peter, just just for some background, like our dynamic on the podcast is usually Demir is very insistent on the darkness of humanity. And he always comes back to that. I, I have some of that, but there's a part of me that retains the ide the American idealism. So, Demir. No, no, no. Look, Peter. He, let me let me ask you this question. I think this is a a, a good way to sort of round it up to 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 maybe lift us to a, a broader thing. How are you looking at the future right now? I mean, we find ourselves at this, I think, extraordinary moment in American history uh, at with, you know, social activism. Black Lives Matter is dominating the political debate. We have Donald Trump, who's just plummeting in the polls. Um, and then, you know, again, and I like I said at the beginning, I, I feel like I, I, I personally as a reader, it's hard for me to even if you have started this essay and your, your journey ahead of this moment, it's hard for me to process this essay outside of the current moment. Would you say you're optimistic about the future, about the, just the general sort of trend? I mean, you know, what I was saying earlier, like in my darker moments, I'm not sure I, I feel about, I feel like a, a real sort of sense of progress, but are, it sounds to me at least uh, reading your essay, and, and I think it comes through that there is a kind of optimism about progress, about humanity, about the future, about movement. Uh, would, could you, how do you feel about the moment right now, despite all the challenges, despite everything we face together? So I think there's always a danger for progressives to fall into this notion that um, history, you know, on its own somehow kind of moves uh, in a certain moral uh, upward arc, you know, the arc of the moral universe is long and it, but it bends towards justice as Barack Obama always used to say, like to say, quote Martin Luther King. Um, I think that's not true. Um, and, and we've certainly had some very bitter experience of that not being true in recent years. Um, I think, but I think it can be made true, at least in certain places, in certain moments, um, by popular struggle, by, by movements that are, that are motivated by a moral vision and people who are willing to sacrifice for it. And um, I wrote, I can't speak for, you know, the future of many, many other places and conflicts, but I can, I can just say this, that on this question, which is for me fundamentally not just a question of Palestinian freedom, but a question of Jewish honor, a question about whether a people that has suffered so much um, from bigotry and oppression will actually, uh, and a, a people that was founded 
forged in slavery. The Jewish people only become a people in the book of Exodus in slavery. Um, whether such a people will ins essentially enslave another people or not, to me, is something um, that's fundamental to who I am um, and something that I'm willing to sac fight and sacrifice for in my own little way. Um, and so my hope is that um, other such people can be found among Jews and Palestinians and that we can create the possibilities that, that move us towards moral progress. For me, that would be a, like a sacred, um, uh, would be sacred work. So um, that's what gives me hope. Great. Well, that's a, that's a really good note to end on. Uh, thank you, Peter, for joining us. Um, to all our listeners, um, definitely check out, again, um, you know, Peter's two articles where he goes into more detail on this. Follow him on, on Twitter at Peter Beinart. Um, follow his work at Jewish Currents and The Atlantic. Um, and just for, for us at the podcast, I should note that we now have a Patreon. So if you liked what you heard in this episode, consider um, joining as a Patreon member to get bonus episodes and more. And uh, Peter, thank you for being with us and taking the time. Yeah, real pleasure, Peter. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot.